My fellow Singaporeans, good evening again. This year, we commemorate our bicentennial, 200 years of Singapore's modern history. We back began in January at the Singapore River. Since then, many community groups, businesses, schools, and even individuals have marked the bicentennial in their own ways and reflected on their own histories. I recently attended the Eurasian Festival. This marked 100 years of the Eurasian Association and showcased our unique Eurasian history and culture. Earlier in April, five Indian dance groups held a combined performance, the Natya Yatra, at the Esplanade. They were celebrating 100 years of Indian classical dance in Singapore. There have been many events in the heartlands too. In Tegi, we organized Happily Ever After, then and now, to celebrate the diverse and changing wedding customs in Singapore. Some 90 couples, old and young, took the occasion to renew their wedding vows. You can see them. It was a meaningful and joyous event. For Jalan Kayu, Former residents recreated what their kampong looked like in the good old days, including the barber chair along the five-foot way. And they had one of the old residents, Uncle Ang Achai, who told vivid stories about life in the 1960s, almost like Lake Tai or Gong Gu. <laughs> he had served in the police reserve unit and helped restore order in Geylang during the 1964 racial riots. Uncle Ng also helped to rescue residents during floods. So the young people who think that floods are a very unusual thing, ask him which year. Of course, he couldn't remember. <laughs> because it happened many years. Uncle Ng also took part in our very first National Day Parade, 1966. In this year's parade, we were honoured to have the leaders of our three closest neighbours, Brunei, Indonesia, and Malaysia as our guests. And hundreds of thousands of us have visited the bicentennial experience at Fort Canning. The vivid reenactments brought our rich and complex history to life and reminded us why we are proud to be Singaporean. We had planned to close the show after the September school holidays, but we've received so many requests to extend it so we've decided to extend the bicentennial experience to the end of the bicentennial year. And I hope you will all go and see it if you haven't done so already. It's well worth it and you won't forget the experience. All these activities help us trace our long history and appreciate the broader context that has shaped and created modern Singapore. In our journey, we overcame many difficulties, adapted to drastic changes in our world, and blazed bold paths forward. As we look towards the future, we will need this resourcefulness and resolve more than ever. We have a full agenda. In my Malay speech earlier, I spoke about education and upgrading and the importance of practicing our faiths in open and inclusive ways to strengthen our unity and harmony. I spoke about Islam primarily, but it applies to all faiths. In Mandarin, I spoke about external challenges, particularly what US-China tensions mean for us. I also discussed the economic situation and how we are preparing workers and companies to cope, short-term and long-term. These are important issues which concern all Singaporeans. In my English speech, I want to talk about three other important things. First, enabling every young person to succeed, regardless of his or her background. Second, supporting people to work longer as we are living longer. And third, protecting ourselves from climate change and renewing our city for the next century. 
Let me start with how we are giving our young the best possible start in life. So that anyone who works hard will have a chance to succeed regardless of starting point or family background. Because that's what meritocracy in Singapore is about. We've made good on this promise by investing heavily in education. Our starting point used to be primary one. School brought everyone up to speed. <clears throat> Not just on academics, but also basic health and development. We introduced dental checkups as well as vaccinations. If you are underweight in primary school, you may remember the school milk scheme too. <laughs> Generations of children have been through our schools. They received a sound education and good health care and graduated better educated than their parents. Recently, Save the Children, an international NGO, ranked Singapore the best place in the world for a child to grow up in. And last year, the World Bank published a Human Capital Index. This measures the knowledge, skills and health that a child born today can expect to attain by age 18. Among 157 countries, Singapore ranked first. So when they launched the index in Bali at the IMF World Bank Conference. They invited me to go and be interviewed and share our experience in a very brief 15 minutes, not quite a National Day rally, <laughs> how we made this journey. But the journey is not over. We are going further. We want to start earlier in a child's life because these early years make a big difference to his development. Parents play an important role, but a good preschool education can make a crucial difference. And that's why several years ago, we made a major shift to improve preschool education. Let me share what we've done so far and what more we plan to do. First, we've doubled full day preschool capacity to almost 180,000 places. It's enough places for every child aged three and above. Young parents in newer estates like Sengkang and Pongol are much happier. And they're MPs too, because the queues have shortened. Queues at the preschools and queues at MPS. <laughs> Second, we've upgraded the preschools. The new HDB Void Deck centres are better designed, better appointed. And we've built some mega centres too with even more comprehensive facilities like this PCF Sparkle Tot Centre at Pongol. It looks like a holiday resort, <laughs> but the kids are supposed to study quite hard there. <laughs> the children have plenty of space to run around and enjoy a wider range of activities. And when I visited, these kids were in their cooking studio making pizza. They asked me to pretend to be the teacher. I said, I don't know how to make pizza. Please show me. <laughs> which is what they are doing. Third, we set up MOE kindergartens. By operating kindergartens, MOE gains direct experiences, improves curriculum design, and ultimately raises standards across the industry. MOE kindergartens are also a new preschool model because each one is located together with a primary school. And each kindergarten offers all three mother tongue languages, and provides a bilingual environment just like a primary school. Today, we have 24 MOE kindergartens, and we will more than double the number in the next few years. Fourth, we are giving preschool teachers better training and career progression. We've set out the National Institute of Early Childhood Development, NIEC, to upgrade training for preschool teachers and raise their standing. NIEC enrolled its first students this year. So these are NIEC students. They're actually kindergarten teachers or will be kindergarten teachers. Some are fresh trainees. Others are experienced teachers, like Palanyamal, who's also called Sheila. 
Sheila started out as a preschool teacher. Over time, she upgraded herself with a diploma in teaching and an advanced diploma in leadership. Now she is a vice principal at a PCF preschool. Sheila really enjoys working with children and she is very good at her job. Last year, MOE recognized her as an outstanding preschool mother tongue language teacher. But Sheila aspires to do even better. Recently, she enrolled in NIEC to specialize in Tamil language teaching. So with dedicated teachers like Sheila, our children are in good hands. Well done, Sheila. <laughs> Fifth, we continue to make preschool more affordable. The government funds the anchor operators and partner operators to keep fees down. And all parents receive significant subsidies for childcare, with low-income parents receiving substantially more. Still, for middle-income parents, preschool fees can take up a chunk of their household budget, especially if two or more kids are in preschool at the same time. Like the low family, for example. They are middle-income, both parents are working, they have two sons, Kaylin, who is turning five, and Kyla, who is two. Both boys attend a government-supported preschool. To help families like the Lowe's, we will enhance preschool subsidies. The Lowe's currently do not qualify for additional means-tested subsidies because their household income exceeds their current maximum income, which is 7,005. We will raise this income ceiling to $12,000 a month. And this will extend the means-tested subsidies to 30,000 more households, including the lows. On top of this, we'll also increase the quantum of preschool subsidies across the board. I show you how it works out. Before the changes, Mr. and Mrs. Lowe pay about $560 per month for each child's preschool. The enhanced subsidies will knock off a third of their preschool expenses, which will then go down to around $370 per child. Later on, when Kaylin and Kyla enter primary school, the family's expenses will go down even further. Because primary school itself is almost free, you have to pay a few dollars miscellaneous fees. But if the boys need student care after school in the afternoons, it will cost the lows about $300 per child. So it's even lower than the 370 which they'll be paying after the enhanced subsidies. In the medium term, we aim to bring down full-day preschool expenses to around that level, which means the cost of primary school plus after-school student care. So 370 coming down to around 300. We need a while to get there, but we are working towards that. Recently, several PAP women MPs led by SPS Sun Xueling surveyed young parents on preschool. Understandably, the parents were concerned about affordability. The MPs made an important point that preschool should be like housing and health care, where we have a good and affordable government-funded option for all Singaporeans. There's a private option if you want, but for many Singaporeans, in fact, the majority, the government-supported funded option is high quality and more than satisfactory. I agree with them. For housing, we have HDB. For healthcare, we have the restructured hospitals. Similarly for, similarly, for preschool, we should have good quality, government supported choices available to all Singaporeans. This is, in fact, our policy. Today, just over half of all preschool places are government supported. Over time, we will bring this up to 80%, just like HDB. And we're putting a lot of resources towards this. 
Already the government spends about $1 billion a year on early childhood education. And this will more than double over the next few years. Hopefully with all these improvements, parents will no longer think of preschool as an expensive phase of bringing up their children. The younger ministers have a few more ideas to support couples to have more kids and to keep HDB flats affordable. But I will leave these goodies to them to make the announcements later. Meanwhile, I'll be counting the number of babies born <laughs> and hoping for the number to go up. I want to update you on one more program, and that is Kids Start. We piloted Kids Start three years ago to give extra help to 1,000 children from less privileged families. The Kids Start team advises and supports the parents, often a single parent, on nutrition, child development, on parent-child interaction. We are very happy with the results, and so are the parents. Let's take a look at the video. I'm a single father of two. Before Kids Start, I didn't know how to take part uh, and play a role uh, as a father to teach them something that they really need to know. At first I shy, but I really love my kid. Because of them, I want them to learn together. Kids Start taught me how to involve myself and my kids in terms of education. It's a great bonding between me and my daughter Khadija. My daughters learn a lot of things. There's a memory from the first day that they really can't talk at all. But today, they're the one who tell me what's right. When I go to start, I feel there's a family members who are willing to teach me and guide me. I really look forward to be closer with them. Kids Start is a good program. I'm confident we are on the right track. We still need to follow up a few more years to assess more exactly its benefits. But for each new cohort of babies, there's no time to lose. So we will expand Kids Start to reach another 5,000 children over the next three years. <laughs> then we'll take stock again how to expand Kids Start further. The commitment to do our best for every child is deeply embedded in our education system. That's why we heavily subsidize school fees from preschool to university, poly, and ITE, so that every child can afford a good education. I recently received a letter from an NUS law student, Quick Louie. Louie wrote about how she felt a sense of inferiority when she was growing up because many of her classmates came from better off families. And let me read from her letter. She said, as she grew older, she realized that this was an extremely misplaced sense of shame. My parents had done nothing wrong. They'd supported me throughout my life and gave me the best they could. A few years before Louis entered NUS, her family ran into difficulty. Louis worried about becoming a burden on her family. She already had one sibling in university and another about to start. And even after she started her law course, financial concerns were frequently on her mind, buying books, a laptop, school trips, and other activities. But she applied for and received a bursary, which significantly eased her financial worries. MOE has done a comprehensive review of tertiary fees and bursaries. First, MOE looked at whether 
our universities can operate more economically. Two of them, the Singapore Institute of Technology, SIT, and the Singapore University of Social Sciences, SUSS, are more applied and do more industry attachments and internships. Their operating cost per student can be lower, especially as student intakes grow. So, MOE will lower the annual fees for the full-time general degree programs in SIT and SUSS from around $8,000 now to $7,500. Second, MOE will significantly enhance government bursaries. For university courses, we will increase government bursaries from up to 50% of general degree fees today to up to 75%. Let me show you on a chart. For a general degree program in NUS, like economics or computer science, full fees are about $8,000 a year. Currently, a lower income student would pay around half that, $4,000 a year, if he uses his bursary fully to his fees. With the enhanced bursary, he'll pay only $2,000 per year. <laughs> Similarly, for polytechnic diploma programs, we'll increase the bursary coverage from up to 80% of the fees today to up to 95%. For poly diploma, full fees now, $3,000. With a bursary, a lower income poly student currently pays about $600 a year. After we enhance the bursary, he will pay only $150. I have given examples of lower income students. Actually, six in 10 of students in polys and universities are eligible for government bursaries. So these enhancements will benefit many middle income students too. Students in government funded diploma and degree programs at ITE, NAFA and La Salle will also be covered. I want to say something about one particular university course and that is medicine. It's very expensive to train a medical student. Hence, medicine has the highest course fees of all the university courses. Today, after government subsidies, medical school fees are almost $29,000 a year at NUS and $35,000 a year at NTU. And these are not small amounts. We should not let the cost of medical school deter good students from studying medicine. In fact, we want doctors to have diverse educational and family backgrounds. On the education front, the recent medical school intakes have included more poly graduates, and this year we had one IT graduate for the first time in NUS Medical School. But on the socioeconomic front, we should do more to encourage lower-income students to do medicine. Therefore, we will enhance government bursaries for medical school to make them significantly more generous than bursaries for other courses. And if you add together the government bursary for medicine plus other bursaries from the university, then lower-income students will now pay at most $5,000 per year to study medicine. And this balance can then be covered by student loans with much less difficulty. So if you are a student, you are worried about your finances, but you have an ambition to be a doctor, I say don't worry about the money that will be taken care of. Go for it. All these fee and bursary adjustments I've talked about for both medical and non-medical courses will apply to both existing and new students from the next academic year. The point of these changes to fees and bursaries is not just the dollars and cents. We are determined to make our education system as accessible as possible. 
We want every Singaporean son and daughter to have the opportunity to receive a good education and start well in life, regardless of family circumstances. Students from less privileged backgrounds must be confident that they will get financial help if they need it to see them through their education. They should neither feel disadvantaged nor inferior comparing themselves to better off classmates, nor should they be deterred from pursuing a course just because of money. This is fundamental to maintaining Singapore as an open meritocracy. Apart from government bursaries, our universities, polys and ITE also raise funds to create their own bursaries. And these bursaries often have names associated with them, like the E.W. Barker Bursary in NUS, named after our founding law minister, or the Class of 1995 Term Bursary in NTU. The Class of 1995, that means a class which graduated in 1995, must have come together, raised some money, endowed a bursary, remind the next generation when it comes to your turn, go thou and do likewise. And this personalizes the bursary award. The recipient is grateful to the donor, the donor is happy to have done a good deed, and both donor and recipient honor the person after whom the bursary is named. And in time, hopefully, the recipient will make good, remember, and be moved to pay it forward. Louis, the NUS student who wrote to me, received such a bursary. Hers was a Kwa Gyok Chu bursary, which the NUS Law School had established in my mother's name. So she wrote to me, I think because I was one of those who contributed to the bursary fund, and she wrote in her letter, thank you for opening my eyes to the compassion and generosity of our society, for being the helping hand, and for setting my mind at ease. This is a kindness that will stay with me through my life, and I hope to be able to do my part and help others in similar positions in the future. Thank you, Louis. We wish you... We wish you all the best for your studies. We try very hard to kindle the same warm personal feeling with government bursaries. But alas, it's not so easy to write a letter like that and say, Dear, dear government, thank you very much. <laughs> so to complement the government bursaries, I hope the universities, polytechnics and ITE will set up more bursaries of their own in people's names. And I hope the alumni and community will contribute generously too. The government will match your donations up to three times for the newer universities and up to 1.5 times for the rest. Our institutions often raise funds for new buildings and professorships, and this is always meritorious. But bursaries can make a crucial difference to the recipients, and they have that extra human touch. If you donate towards a bursary, you enable some promising young person to get a good start in life, and this strengthens our sense of obligation to each other and the bonds that link us all together as one society. <clears throat> our education system gives young Singaporeans a head start when they enter the job market, but our support doesn't end there. As people progress in their careers, skills future will help to keep their knowledge and skills up to date. We need to do this because jobs and skills are turning over faster than ever. And we also need to keep on reskilling ourselves for another reason. Singaporeans are living longer and mostly also want to work longer. So my next topic is about helping Singaporeans work longer if they wish to do so. Our life expectancy at birth, the latest figures which came out just a few weeks ago, is now nearly 85 years. It's the longest in the world, now even longer than Japan.
And this means about half of us can expect to live longer than 85. And we all know many people who are older than 85. Quite a few turned up for my National Day Observance Ceremony at Tikgi, including this sprightly lady, Madam Liang Juat Eng. And she is 102. In the rally in 2007, when I talked about ageing, I checked up the numbers and reported that we then had 500 centenarians, people aged 100 and over. So this year, for my speech, I said, please update the number. And just, in just over a decade, the number has more than doubled. Now, we have 1,300 centenarians, including Madam Liang. That means every MP has about 14 of them. <laughs> Should look them up. And I hope some of them are watching my speech on TV. The good news is that Singaporeans stay healthy for longer too, protected by MediShield life. Most seniors, in fact, don't want to stop working. We're healthy for longer, we live longer, but we don't want to spend more years idle in retirement. We want to stay active, engaged, feel a sense of worth and purpose. Zumba! <laughs> and more things. Also, many of us want to build up bigger nest eggs for when we eventually retire. Therefore, many of us have multiple careers in a lifetime. Enabling seniors to continue working productively takes a joint effort. Employers must redesign their training, jobs, and careers around the abilities and strengths of the older workers. The older workers may not be as strong or quick as their younger colleagues, but actually this is not a problem in many jobs, where we can redesign the job or we can use technology. And this way, employers can continue to tap on the skills, knowledge, and experience of our older workers. Employees, on their part, must adopt the right mindset. We must be ready to adapt, learn new things, and take on different responsibilities. We cannot just be satisfied doing our old jobs well, because many jobs will change, and some jobs will disappear. Shorthand typists and telephone switchboard operators do not exist anymore. Reskilling ourselves must start early, even when we are in our 40s and 50s, if not even earlier. But 40s and 50s, you're not quite so young anymore, not yet old, and you have to pay attention. Because if you do it then, then you will have useful skills which will be valuable, we hope, as you near retirement age, and you can keep improving even in our 60s. Of course, the government will fully support employers and employees in this endeavour. I visited Workforce Singapore's Careers Connect Centre in January. There I met Naharia Mohammad Noor. She used to be a bank teller. Naharia, Naharia is the one in the red tudong. Nowadays, banks need fewer tellers because of online banking, ATMs, and now VTMs, or video teller machines, which are more advanced than ATMs. Naharia took up an offer by her employer to retrain as a customer service officer for VTMs. She doesn't stand around at the VTMs. She's sitting at a console in an ops room, monitoring multiple VTMs. So when customers have problems with a VTM, they press the help button on the machine, and Naharia's face pops up on the screen. And she advises customers what to do. And she told me usually the first question she asks is, are you real or are you AI? <laughs> so she smiles and she goes, no, no, I'm real. And the customers may be a bit doubtful at first because the AI can be very good, but very soon they can tell she has the human touch. As a result, Naharia is doing a new job, serves more customers than she used to, and can be productive and employable for many more years. Well done, Naharia.
I should also commend Naharia's employer, DBS. DBS has made great efforts to modernize itself and to adopt technology. In the past year, it was named the best bank in the world by three major industry publications. Most importantly, DBS has been working very hard to retrain its employees. It's shown care and concern for its people, even as it transforms itself. In fact, if it didn't show care and concern for its people, it's unlikely to become the best bank in the world. So DBS has the right approach, and I encourage other companies to emulate DBS's example. Good job, La DBS. <laughs> it's not just big companies that can retrain and upgrade workers. So can SMEs. This is Chan Ban Kyong. He's 64, much older than Naharia. Ban Kyong has been in the marine industry for over 30 years. He works for Mencast Marine, which makes and repairs ship propellers. He used to make the ship propellers by hand. First, he crafts a mold out of sand to create a prototype pro propeller. Then he uses this aluminium prototype to make a second mold. Finally, he casts the bronze propeller itself. It's hard work and it requires experience and skill. Mencast decided to increase productivity by using 3D printers to manufacture the propeller prototypes. But they still valued the experienced eye of their older workers to ensure the quality of the work. So they are training Ban Kyong and eight colleagues to operate their 3D printers. And all of them are over 60. Now their work will become safer and easier, and the production time will be faster by a third. So it's win-win-win for the workers, the company, and customers too. And that's the way it should be. Well done, Men Kast and Ban Kyong. I hope more companies will likewise help their older workers remain employable well into their 60s. The government will do its best to support older workers and the businesses that employ them. Last year, the Ministry of Manpower, MOM, set up a tripartite work group on older workers to study the, the issue. I met the work group members last month for lunch. They told me they had had intense discussions. Even at lunch, the discussions were quite intense. <laughs> Why? The older workers wanted to be certain of continued employment for longer. When can I retire later? Can I be re-employed longer? Can I be re-employed more years at a time? But employers were worried about business costs and the uncertain economic outlook. And they said, I support you, I understand your aspirations, but I need more flexibility. Because I don't know what will happen. And if I go broke, your job's gone too. In the end, the work group reached consensus. They made four key recommendations. First, to raise the retirement age from 62 today to 65. Second, to raise the re-employment age from 67 today to 70. Third, to increase CPF contributions for older workers. And fourth, to achieve all this in gradual steps by about 2030. I think these are sensible recommendations. The government accepts them in full. Let me explain them a little bit more, and I will start with the CPF for older workers, which is a bit more complicated. Today, CPF contribution rates for workers begin to taper down after the workers turn 55. So you see the age of the workers and the different contribution rates. Up to 55, you pay the full rate. Beyond 55, it comes steps down. Beyond 60, it steps down again. Beyond 65, it steps down. And it continues on as long as you're working. We will raise the rates for workers above 55. We will take the first step in 2021. 
So you will see the rates go up for these groups of workers. And we will take subsequent steps after that. And the whole process will take 10 years or so about that, but it will depend on economic conditions. And by the time we are done, those who are 60 and below will all get the full rates and all pay the full rates, and then the step down will only start here. So you pay the full rates all the way up to when you are 60, and then the rates come down, come down at 65, come down again at 70, and at 70, they level off. So this is the first change to increase CPF for older workers gradually over the next 10 years or so. Next, in 2022, a year after we raised the CPF the first time, we will start to raise both the retirement age and re-employment age for all employers. The retirement age will go from 62, which is what it is today, to 63 in 2022, and eventually to 65 by 2030. And the re-employment age will go from 67, which it is where it is now, to 68, also in 2022, and eventually to 70 by 2030. And therefore, by 2030, we should reach our first and second objectives, which means retirement age goes to 65, and the re-employment age goes to 70. The government will help businesses to adjust to these new arrangements. We'll implement a support package for them, and DPM Hing Sui Kiat will announce it in next year's budget. As a major employer ourselves, the government will take the lead for public offices. The public service will raise its retirement and re-employment ages one year early, 2021 instead of 2022. And I encourage private sector companies which can do the same also to do so. All these changes to the retirement age, the re-employment age and the CPF rates will support older workers to continue working longer and to be more financially independent. Let me add one last point here to be absolutely clear. We are not making any changes to CPF withdrawal policies <laughs> or CPF withdrawal ages. Uh, uh, let me say that once again in case you didn't take it down. <laughs> we are not making any changes to CPF withdrawal policies or to CPF withdrawal ages. You can still take out some money at age 55 and you can still start your CPF payouts from age 65. All this remains exactly the same. And if you hear anybody tell you something different, please ignore him <laughs> or her. <laughs> and, and if it comes to you on WhatsApp from a friend, please delete it and tell your friend. <laughs> Don't add, share it with more friends and confuse people because that will be fake news. <laughs> Pofma will catch you. Next, let me talk about renewing our city and our home for the next century. I will start with climate change. Climate change may seem abstract and distant for many of us, but it is one of the gravest challenges facing humankind. Our young people instinctively appreciate the seriousness of the issue. When the National Youth Council recently asked young people what their vision was for Singapore's future, many spoke about the environment. Let's hear from them. Climate change is a big issue. As you can see, Singapore is getting warmer. We can all do our part. Uh, I hope that in 2025, Singapore will be a model example for sustainable practices. My hope is for Singapore to be more conscious of its consumption. Climate change is a big issue and I think we should all take a part to make a change um, by, not, uh, by recycling materials and not wasting resources. 
What is climate change? What is it about? Why should we be concerned? Let me try and explain a huge and complicated subject simply and briefly. Human activity is pumping more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We produce CO2 when we drive a car or take a plane or run a manufacturing plant or use electrical appliances at home because nearly all our electricity is generated from natural gas, which is a fossil fuel. The CO2 builds up in the atmosphere, it traps heat from the sun and causes the planet to warm up. Already, the Earth's average temperature has gone up by one degree Celsius compared to pre-industrial times over 100 years ago. One degree Celsius doesn't sound like much, but it is very significant. Furthermore, temperatures are continuing to rise faster and faster. Ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica are melting into the oceans, and this is raising sea levels around the world. The UN currently projects that sea levels will rise by up to one metre by the end of this century. One metre, about three feet, is just 80 years from now. But the scientists' estimates have been going up, so sea levels may quite possibly rise higher and faster than that. Global warming is also making the weather more extreme. Droughts are getting more severe and prolonged, Rainfall and storms are becoming more intense. Singapore is already feeling the impact. Our weather is palpably hotter. Rainstorms are heavier. And this will very likely worsen over the next few decades, within the lifetimes of many of us. A recent Swiss study found that by 2050, just 30 years from now, several cities in the world will experience unprecedented climate shifts. And it found that one of them will be Singapore. We must prepare for the impact of climate change on Singapore. There are many risks and consequences. New diseases, more frequent pandemics, food shortages, forced migration of displaced populations, even wars. And because we are a low-lying island, Singapore is especially vulnerable to one grave threat, and that is rising sea levels. In the 1960s and 70s, floods were common in Singapore, especially during the rainy season. That's why Uncle Ng Achai from Jalan Kayu, whom I told you about earlier, had to rescue so many stranded residents whenever it flooded. When we had high tides, monsoon drains in low-lying parts of Singapore would fill up almost to the brim, even if it wasn't raining. And if it did rain, it would flood. Gan Kim Yong told me when he was a child, his family lived in Hong Kong Street in Chinatown, where his father ran a shop. Hong Kong Street is next to this one. This one is Temple Street. But it looked like this also. When there was an exceptionally high tide, which happened a few times a year, the tide water would rise up from the drains onto the five-foot way in front of the shop even without rain. And so his father had to build racks to stack up the goods out of the reach of the water. To Kim Yong, who was then a boy, this was great fun. <laughs> I, I don't think that is Gan Kim Yong. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, it was a serious matter. These old flooding problems are now largely resolved. We improved the drainage system. We required buildings to be built on higher platforms, at least three meters above the mean sea level. Three meters sounds a lot, because a person, most of us are less than two meters tall. But three meters isn't actually that high, because at high tide, the water can go up two meters above the mean sea level. And that leaves only one meter buffer to cope with other factors. For example, heavy rain. So if it rains, it fills up a little bit, and you're still OK. And the water has somewhere to go. 
So because of this one meter buffer, we've managed to deal with our flooding problems thus far. But with global warming, if sea levels rise by one meter, our buffer is gone. Because when it's high tide, two meters above that, you're already water reaching the five foot way. We will have no more buffer. And if heavy rain coincides with a high tide, the water will have nowhere to go. And we will literally be in deep water. <laughs> like Bangladesh, whenever they are hit by a cyclone. Or to take an extreme example, like New Orleans, much of which is below sea level. Here you can see how the city was completely flooded when Hurricane Katrina hit it in 2005. So what can we do? Three things. Understand climate change, mitigate climate change, and adapt to climate change. And let me explain them one by one. First of all, we have to understand what climate change means specifically for Singapore. Is it hot weather, cold weather, hot weather, extreme weather, drought, intense rain, water levels, sea levels, and therefore what do we do? So we've set up a Centre for Climate Research Singapore, CCRS. I visited them earlier this year. They have a team of scientists and meteorologists and supercomputers to model the weather and do research. They showed me the records they have, which go back more than a century, including these old weather diaries, which I'm looking at. And they go back to the 1930s, which are meticulously kept, were meticulous, meticulously kept at the weather station on Mount Faber. CCRS is cooperating with their counterparts in neighbouring countries to study in more detail how climate change is affecting Southeast Asia. And they're finding that Singapore, being near the equator, is more vulnerable to climate change than the global model suggests. Second, we must mitigate climate change. What does mitigate mean? It means we must do our part to reduce CO2 emissions. Singapore has joined international efforts to reduce emissions. We are part of the Paris Climate Agreement, and we have committed to slow down and ultimately cap our CO2 emissions by around 2030. To help achieve this, last year, we introduced a carbon tax. Each of us can do our bit to promote sustainability and mitigate climate change, like remembering to switch off the lights, reducing waste, and reusing and recycling more. In Singapore, we generate a huge amount of waste whether from excessive packaging, food waste, or electronic waste. And these all have to be disposed of and often incinerated, which then generates more CO2. Our landfill is at Pulau Semakau, but eventually that will fill out, and then we will need Bukit Semakau. <laughs> and then Gunung Semakau. <laughs> so we have to find a sustainable solution. And this is where young Singaporeans have been doing their part, like Farah Sanwari, who is passionate about sustainability. Farah co-founded Repair Kopitiam a few years ago to teach others how to repair damaged electronics appliances, furniture, toys, and clothing, so that these items can gain a new lease of life and you can use them longer instead of throwing them away prematurely. I think we need more young Singaporeans to be like Farah, to be problem solvers, innovators, scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs. As the song says, be prepared to do our part. This is the grand challenge for their generation. Although Singapore may not be able to stop climate change by ourselves, we can contribute to solutions and we must do our fair share. Then we can be credible asking others to reduce their emissions too and work towards a global solution to climate change. But unfortunately, such a global solution is still very far off. So we must work for the best, but be prepared for the worst. Therefore, the third thing we must do is adapt to climate change. 
and especially rising sea levels. We will need local measures to protect individual buildings and developments, and we've been doing this. For example, we've built MRT stations with elevated entrances. When you enter an MRT station, you need to climb up a few steps before you go down the escalator. And this is flood protection for our MRT system. And if we need to raise the steps higher, well, we will do that one day. We also require new developments to be built on higher platforms. Instead of building three meters above mean sea level like before, they must now be at least four meters above mean sea level. And for critical infrastructure like Changi Airport Terminal 5 and Tuas Port, we are raising the platforms even higher, at least five meters above mean sea level. But local measures will not be enough. We have many older buildings. These cannot be lifted up or transported to higher ground. In fact, large parts of Singapore are low-lying, and we need to protect these low-lying areas as a whole. Let me show you the topography of Singapore. This is a map of Singapore showing the heights. The light green is the lowest parts. The dark green, a little bit higher. The beige are the hills, and the dark brown are our mountains. <laughs> but there are not very many dark brown pieces, so I don't think we can all retreat to live on Bukit Timah. <laughs> now let me show you the lowest parts, those which are up to four meters above mean sea level. That's where all the blue stuff comes in. You see the island looks much smaller if those one day become at risk. When sea levels rise, all these parts will increasingly be at risk. Not underwater yet, but at risk like Chinatown used to be in the old days, high tide, rain, trouble. And if you look carefully, there's a long stretch along the east coast to the city, and zoom in a little bit, you might be able to see where your house is. So, not only will property values be affected, but safety and livability also. And it won't just be if your house is in the pink area, you're in trouble. But the whole city, because the roads and the trains run through the low-lying areas, hospitals, schools, workplaces, all there, we can't lose a big chunk of our city and expect the rest of Singapore to carry on as usual. Therefore, Beyond localized measures, we need to protect entire areas. And the way to do that is to build coastal defenses. We've studied our whole coastline in detail, and we've divided it into different segments. Some are more vulnerable than others, and we need different strategies to protect each of them. And we will have to prioritize the work, starting with the more critical segments, and in particular, East Coast City, or City East Coast, and also Jurong Island. I will talk about City East Coast, which is a long stretch, comprising the city area and then the eastern coastline. Let's look at the city area first. We built the Marina Reservoir and Marina Barrage to protect the city area from flooding. Many of us enjoy visiting the Marina Barrage to picnic and fly kites on the top of the pump house, especially if we have little kids. But PUB did not build the pump house for kite flying. <laughs> its real purpose is to house seven giant pumps. That's why it's so tall. When it rains heavily during high tide, these pumps pump water out of Marina Reservoir into the sea, so that rain falling in the city area can then drain into Marina Reservoir. When sea levels rise, one pump house will not be enough. We will need to build a second pump house on the opposite end of the barrage, and PUB has planned for this. So that's the city. For the eastern coastline, we'll need possibly other solutions. We've looked at other countries for inspiration, in particular, we studied the Netherlands. 
The word Netherlands itself means low-lying lands. Nether, low-lying lands. And half of the Netherlands is at most one meter above sea level. In fact, one quarter of the land is actually below sea level, what the Dutch call polders. And polders is land, this is one of them, that the Dutch have reclaimed from the sea. They first build a sea wall in the sea, in the water, then enclose an area, then you pump out the water behind the sea wall and you create dry land. And that dry land can be lower than sea level. And then you have to keep on pumping water out. The Dutch are famous for their windmills. But do you know why the Dutch originally built windmills? It wasn't to take tourist pictures. <laughs> it was to pump water out of the polders and keep the land dry. I don't think windmills will do very well in Singapore. <laughs> the only windmill we had in Singapore <laughs> was Holland Village. And even that one is gone now. But polders are a serious option for us. We are building a small pole at Pulau Tekong to gain some experience operating one. This is on the northwest part of Pulau Tekong. If you come in from the north to land at Changi, you can see it. You can see we are building the sea wall here, enclose the sea, and we will level off the land behind that and pump out the water, and this will be a polder. And we will use the new land for SAF training. Boulders are one option to protect our eastern coastline. Because instead of just building a seawall along the coastline, you extend out with a polder, build a seawall further out. You not only protect the existing low-lying pink areas, but you extend out and create more land reclaimed from the sea, which we can use for housing and other valuable purposes. So that's one possible solution for the East Coast to build polders along the coastline. But there are other alternatives. For example, we could reclaim a series of islands offshore from Marina East all the way to Changi. Then we join up the islands, connect them with barrages, create a freshwater reservoir behind them like that, which would be similar to the Marina Reservoir and this solution will make PUB very happy because we will have another big reservoir and enhance our water resilience. Our four taps will become more reliable. What I showed you are just artist impressions. I prepared them for this speech to give you a sense of the possibilities. We have not done engineering drawings yet. But we will examine all the options carefully and when the time comes, we will decide what is the best way to do it? This problem does have good engineering solutions, although they will all cost money. How much will it cost to protect ourselves against rising sea levels? My guess is probably $100 billion over 100 years, quite possibly more. If we only have 10 years to solve the problem, we won't have the time or the resources to do it. But this is because this is a 50 to 100 year problem, we can implement a 50 to 100 year solution to this problem. And in Singapore, long term problems, we can make long term solutions. Not everywhere, but in Singapore, yes, we can. We should treat climate defences, climate change defences, like we treat the SAF, with utmost seriousness. Work steadily at it, maintain a stable budget year after year, keep your eye on the target, and do it over many years and several generations. That way we can afford it, and when we need it, we will have it ready. Both the SAF and climate change defences are existential for Singapore. These are life and death matters. 
everything else must bend at the knee to safeguard the existence of our island nation. There is one difference between the two. With the SAF, we hope never to go to war. And if you have a strong SAF, you may deter threats and avoid having to go to war. But with climate change, we know for sure sea levels will rise. And the only uncertainty is whether they rise a few decades earlier or a few decades later. Therefore, we'll implement our climate change plans progressively and keep them flexible. But we must start now and sustain the effort, as the Dutch have done over the centuries and as we have done with the SAF. We must make this effort, otherwise one day our children and grandchildren will be ashamed of what our generation did not do. Beyond protecting ourselves from rising seas, we also have long-term plans to remake and take full advantage of our coastline. One of these plans is the Greater Southern Waterfront. I first spoke about this in the 2013 rally. Since then, we've worked out more definite ideas and let me first sketch out the overall shape. The GSW comprises 30 kilometers of our southern coastline, from Gardens by the Bay East all the way to Pasir Panjang. And it's about 2,000 hectares of land. It's six times the size of Marina Bay, or in other terms, about two pongos. The GSW includes the PSA city terminals, which are at Tanjung Paga, at Brani, and at Keppel. And they also include the Pasir Panjang terminals. By 2027, the city terminals will go to Tuas, where we are building a new port. And later on, in 2040, the Pasir Panjang terminal will also go to Tuas port. And this will free up prime land for redevelopment. It will be an opportunity to reshape the Greater Southern Waterfront into a new place to live, work and play. And let me start with live. Here is Keppel Golf Course, Keppel Club. It's close to two MRT stations, you can see them, and also to Labrador Park down here, the nature park. Nature Reserve. The lease is expiring in two years' time, so this will be one of the first Greater Southern Waterfront developments. And there's enough land here to build 9,000 housing units. Not quite so fast, but 9,000 housing units. HDB and private housing with waterfront promenades, with greenery and open spaces. And that's just a start because there is space and land for public and private housing elsewhere in the Greater Southern Waterfront too. And with the GSW, the size of two pongos, you get a sense of the possibilities. Think of it as pongol by the bay. <laughs> Next, I go to work, the commercial areas. Several big companies already have offices in Labrador, in near Labrador Park, like Google or Cisco or Unilever. And we will develop more office space in the GSW, like this one, which is Maple Tree Business Park, which will bring in more jobs. People can work near where they live and live near where they work, and this will create life and activity during the day and at night. I take it this is at night. Finally, I come to play. Actually, I got there already. <laughs> the fun part. There are many possibilities for fun and recreation. We will start by redeveloping two old power stations in Pasir Panjang. These are the Pasir Panjang power stations. They used to supply electricity back in the 1960s, but they were decommissioned long ago. And we can find creative new uses for them, just like the way we made St. James Power Station near Vivo City into a nightlife destination. Next, after Brani Terminal moves out, we can develop Pulau Brani together with Sentosa. 
We will build new attractions on Brani, just like we have Universal Studios on Sentosa, which is this block here. And we will also revitalize Sentosa's beach areas and expand its nature and heritage trails to keep its island character. We will also link up the GSW with all the surrounding green areas so that you have a whole connection from West Coast Park to East Coast Park and also from Rail Corridor all the way down to Sentosa. And with a new green heart at the center, Singapore will be even more of a city in a garden. I have already received one special request. When we discussed these plans in Cabinet, Nti Meng put his hand up. He said, NTUC is very grateful to the government for downtown east. How about a downtown south? <laughs> so, so I said, OK, we will do that. We will set aside land for the labor movement to build a resort, probably on Pulau Brani. We will make this gesture. We will make this gesture to thank our workers for all their contributions to the nation, because Singapore is for all of us. Our city today comprises multiple layers and the imprints of different eras. The Greater Southern Waterfront will add yet more layers to the city. Over the centuries, people have come to Singapore from different lands, bringing with them their identities, cultures, and beliefs, their hopes and dreams, their passions and aspirations. And slowly, they wove these strands together to become Singaporeans and to build today's Singapore. And the layout and the architecture of our city reflects this richness and complexity. Faint traces of ancient Singapore survive even today. In the 14th century, there were settlements at the mouth of the Singapore River and near Bukit Larangan, known as Fort Canning Hill. Soon after the British arrived in 1819, they made a map of Singapore. It's a very interesting map. Let me orientate you. This is the Singapore River, the river mouth. This is the Padang. In those days, it was bigger. And this is Fort Canning Hill. And along the map, if you look carefully, you can see a linear feature all the way here up around Fort Canning Hill and is marked historical lines of Singapore. And along this line, there is a river to be seen. So these historical lines of Singapore are actually an ancient defensive line. It's like, it's a line of defense. It's an earth wall dating back hundreds of years. And the river which runs along the earth wall today is today the Stamford Canal. So the wall itself is gone, but Stamford Road follows the line of that wall. So today, if you walk along Stamford Road, you are walking along the ancient wall of Singapura. There's history there. Parts of our civic district and central business district are still laid out according to the first town plan that Raffles and his team drew up 200 years ago. Many of the colonial buildings remain, often restored and repurposed. So the former Supreme Court and City Hall have become the National Gallery Singapore. Over two centuries, we have built and rebuilt generations of buildings. Today, we've created a distinctive city skyline and a vibrant waterfront all around Marina Bay. When we first reclaimed Marina Bay, Marina East, Central and South, 40 years ago, they were empty, a blank slate. For some years, we left the new land fallow. Definite plans only came later. 
as we developed a clearer sense of what the city needed and began putting the building blocks in place. Now, a new downtown is taking shape in Marina South, anchored around the Marina Bay Financial Centre and Marina Bay Sands. Marina Bay is still far from fully developed. Meanwhile, we are already looking ahead for our next major move. Our modern port dates back to Raffles, who recognised Singapore's qualities as a natural harbour. Nearly 50 years ago, we converted the wharves at Tanjong Paga into our first container terminal. In 1991, as Tanjong Paga reached its limits, we made a major decision to reclaim land at Pasir Panjang to build a new container terminal. At that time, PSA was handling 6 million containers a year. They call them TEUs, 20-foot equivalent units. But PSA had audacious plans to build a port to handle six times that number, 36 million TEUs. People say, Siawa. <laughs> Building Pasir Panjang Terminal was a considerable act of faith. But we backed PSA up and PSA delivered. And last year, it handled 36 million TEUs and more. Now we are making another leap, building Tuas Port, where PSA can double its volumes. When PSA moves out of the city and Pasir Panjang terminals, these old spaces will once again be vacant, another blank slate. And a new generation will have another opportunity to imagine and to build here some part of their vision for Singapore. I hope they'll remember to place a marker somewhere to remind themselves that PSA used to be there and that it was the same daring and ambition, the same drive for excellence and determination to prevail that made PSA a success and will make the Greater Southern Waterfront a reality. Over the years, I've talked about many major projects at National Day rallies. These are all progressively taking shape. In 2013, I described Jewel at Changi Airport. At that time, Jewel was just a concept and an ambition. Now we have completed it on time and within budget. Kudos to the Changi team. <laughs> Singapore has a spectacular new gateway to the world. Many of you have visited, and we are all rightly very proud of it. What we talk about, this government, we will deliver. In the same way, we are realising our other ambitious plans. Pongol Digital District, Jurong Lake District, Changi Terminal 5, redevelopment of Paya Lebar Air Base, Tuas Port, and of course, the Greater Southern Waterfront. All these will not be done in a decade or even in one generation. There will be space for successive generations to fill with their hopes and dreams. Each new generation will leave their mark on our city as their predecessors have done. This bicentennial year, as we commemorate our history and progress, we also commit ourselves to improve on what we have and build a better Singapore for our children. All this depends on Singaporeans remaining one united people and having an honest and capable government working together with you, for you, for Singapore.
The next few years will be very demanding. We have to hand over smoothly to a new generation of leaders and continue to strive to realize our ambitions. My team will work with you to build this jewel of a nation so that Singapore will always be a vibrant, thriving city where opportunities are open to all and our, ch our children and their children will have a bright future. Let us strive together to create this future. Let us unite as one nation to build tomorrow's Singapore. Thank you and good night.